Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about uh, how to oxidize alcohols and aldehydes using various re uh, oxidizing agents that include, includes manganate, so in here I have potassium manganate permanganate written down uh, or the dichromate or the CrO3 which technically creates chromic acid which is H2CrO4 which is also called Jones test and I'll tell you how you to look for a positive Jones test in addition you can be looking for the PCC PDC HiO4 that's going to be used to oxidize the diodes and eventually I want to talk uh, more spend more time on the sworn oxidation because that's more common uh, these days. So let's start with uh, either potassium permanganate or the potassium dichromate. So typically we use potassium dichromate or sodium dichromate or you can also use CrO3 uh, but those are used in the presence of an acid because uh, when you react the chromate it makes the chromic acid which is the H2Cr Oh, four. So you may see the chromic acid being written there as well. Um, so suppose I'm using K2Cr2, so this should have been 7 here, O7, and then we are doing this in the presence of an acid, so I can literally use H2SO4. So at primary alcohols, in this particular case, is going to get oxidized to an aldehyde first, and then in the second step, it's going to get oxidized to an acid. Now, it's not really easy to isolate to isolate the aldehyde, so eventually your end product is going to be the acid. So if you have to stop your oxidation at the aldehyde, you would have to use something else. But if you're using either caminophore or uh, dichromate or CrO3 or chromic acid, it's going to go all the way to the acid. Now, how do you look for a positive test? Remember, the CrO3, in this particular case, uh, the chromium is going to have a positive six oxidation state and eventually by the time it gets ox uh, it, this chromium actually get reduced because it's oxidizing someone else so when it gets reduced it eventually get reduced to cr3 plus so those two uh, chromium oxidation numbers has different colors so chromium six plus is going to be orange in color and then chromium three plus is going to be green to bluish in color. So that's one you know is positive test. So let's suppose you add this Jones reagent, which is a combination of uh, a dichromate with an acid uh, in a primary alcohol. It will start out with an orange solution, but then eventually it's going to turn into a green-blue solution, and that's when you know it got in primary alcohol. If you treating the secondary alcohols, like in this case I have down here, the secondary alcohols using any of those oxidizing agents, whether it's an acamina 4 or K2Cr2, O7, so I'm just going to go and write down Cr03, just as a you know, different setup there, this get oxidized to an ketone. So secondary alcohols get oxidized to an ketone. And then if you have a tertiary alcohol like this one right there, remember there's really not any hydrogen on that uh, carbon. So previously you had two hydrogens on the primary carbon, a primary alcohol. and the secondary alcohol, you have one hydrogen and that you could get rid of making an ketone, but in tertiary you don't really have any hydrogens. So since you don't have any hydrogen, it doesn't really do any oxidation reaction, so there's not going to be any reaction in this particular case. So Jones reagents can actually be used to distinguish between this primary, secondary, and a tertiary alcohol. So tertiary alcohols will give you a negative Jones test, and then primary and secondary alcohols will give you a positive Jones test. And in addition to that, if you have an aldehyde or a ketone, you can also use Jones test because aldehyde eventually gives you a positive Jones test because aldehyde can get converted to an acid. But if you have a ketone, ketone is not going to get converted into an acid because it doesn't really get oxidized after that. So that gives you a negative Jones test. But uh, 
uh, you want to use your test here carefully. But now, remember I said earlier, it's hard to al uh, isolate aldehydes from the primary alcohol, so there is a, another reagent that you could technically use to uh, convert primary alcohols to an aldehyde and stop the oxidation right there, and those are going to be your mild uh, oxidizing agents, and the typical examples is going to be either PCC and a PDCC, PDC. So those are the structures of these PCC and PDC, and uh, you know I could use either one of those, They're typically used with methylene chloride as your solvent here and this end up making only an aldehyde in this particular case so we'll stop the reaction right there if it's in a secondary alcohol it will still oxidize I'm going to go right down PDC in this particular case um, it will still oxidize it but it will stop it at ketone, obviously. Well, ketone doesn't really get oxidized further anyways, uh, so it will stop the reaction right there. So it's not only for the primary alcohols, you can also use it for the secondary alcohol, but it makes it on a ketone. Now, I didn't really draw the mechanisms for any of those. Yes, these reagents are used here and there, but nowadays there are more common reagents uh, that are actually less um, they are more, they are kind of safer to the en environment because these particular reagents, whether it's in a manganate or the dichromate, they use uh, these transition metals. They are not good for the environment, so there are better ways of doing these reactions, especially these oxidation reactions. And one of the good examples is sporin oxidation. That's a very common example. Now, the sporin oxidation is also used to convert primary alcohols to an aldehyde, so it stops the uh, oxidation at an aldehyde, and you can also use this to convert secondary alcohols to an ketone. And I want to talk about the mechanism of that as well. So just as an overall reaction, so this is in a primary, primary alcohol, so this primary alcohol is going to make an uh, aldehyde, and it will stop the reaction right there. But the good thing about this reaction, it makes some of the side products that are actually going to be very easy to remove. It's going to make carbon monoxide, it's going to make carbon dioxide, and it's going to make a disulfide, dimethyl sulfide. And all of those are actually gases, and you can easily get rid of these uh, from the reaction solution. They will just uh, go away from the reaction solution. And this is typically done in the presence of a base, uh, either a pyridine or the triethylamine could be used as your base. So let's look at how does the mechanism really work in this case. So I suppose this is your DMSO, dimethyl sulfonyl oxide there, and uh, this is going to have a resonance structure where I can go ahead and draw this, something like this. So I got sulfur here, and I got only one bond between the sulfur and oxygen. Oxygen is getting the negative charge there, sulfur is getting the positive charge. So then in the first step, I can go ahead and have this nucleophilic attack right here. And then this is going to be breaking the pi bond, bringing the lone pair on that oxygen. So I want to go ahead and uh, you know just copy some of this down just for the sake of time. So it's this right there. And then I'm obviously creating a new bond here. So I'll draw that with a different color. And then I got this rest of the molecule. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw that again. So this part stays as it is. And then remember, you got a the chlorine there and you got an O minus here. So when this uh, high. Uh, high energy intermediate uh, brings back this lone pair right here. It will have a good leaving group, so then in that case, chlorine leaves. And then you make this, I'm going to go ahead and draw that down here. I'm just going to copy this down. So we'll go ahead and get rid of this chlorine there. And now we got this double bond between the carbon and oxygen. So then the next step, we have this 
Chloride that we just got rid of will be doing the nucleophilic attack on this sulfur here. And that's going to break open this bond here where um, this is how it's going to work. This is going to make the carbon dioxide like this. And then it's going to make a carbon monoxide here. And the chloride is also going to leave along the side there. So we have sulfur with two metal grips on it. And obviously I got the chlorine attached to it now. All right. So still sulfur has a positive charge because it lost uh, one bond there. And then on the side, I made CO. I made a CO2 there, and I also have the chloride made. So this uh, a particular intermediate that you make with the sulfur with 2-methyl and chlorine is going to be called the chlorodimethyl sulfonium ion. So we're just going to write that down there. Now, this is going to be used in your alcohol, whether it's a primary alcohol or a secondary alcohol. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this down here. All right, so I'll go ahead and copy this uh, chlorodimethyl sulfonium ion as well. So remember, this sulfur having a positive charge is going to be very electrophilic. So I can use the lone pair from the oxygen to attack this sulfur. And in the process, the chlorine is going to leave here. All right, so I can go ahead and draw this out. So I'm going to copy that down here. So Remember, I'll redraw the hydrogen there. The hydrogen is, was already there. So now I got this new bond made between the sulfur and I got this dimethyl there. And I have lost the, the chloride here. So this gets a positive charge here. This still have a positive charge. And then, you know, obviously the chloride had left there. So then the next is uh, I got the positive charge. I got a protonated oxygen there. I can use the base now. And uh, the typical base, uh, like I said, is going to be the triethylamine. So I can go ahead and write down like this, triethylamine. This is going to come back and grab this proton here. And it's going to restore the electron density on that oxygen here. So I can just copy this one down. All right, so in the next step, I can go ahead and use another molecule. So typically, your uh, base is going to be used in excess, or a lot of times you can use the base as your solvent here. I can use one of these protons on this methyl group. So I'm just going to draw only one of them. So it's going to grab that proton here. And it's going to create the negative charge on that carbon there. So let me just go ahead and make this again. So you get a negative charge right here. And now we can go ahead and remove this proton. So another proton transfer reaction, which is actually going to be an intramolecular now because we're using the same molecule as your acid and as your base here. And uh, this works out fine because if you count uh, the ring here, it's going to be, let me get a different color there. It's going to be one, one, two, three, four, and five. So it's a five member ring, so it's okay to do an intramolecular proton transfer here. So where this is going to be coming in, grabbing that proton. Let me redraw that. And it's going to be going in there like this. And it's going to be coming in here to restore the electron density back on the sulfur. So at the end of the day, I will have an aldehyde created here.
All right, so that's your aldehyde, and your other side product here is going to be dimethyl sulfide, which is also going to be a gas, and you can easily get rid of it. So this is how a typical mechanism is going to look like for this swarn oxidation. Remember, the swarn oxidation is a more environment-friendly way of uh, oxidizing alcohols, uh, primary alcohols into an aldehyde, and the secondary alcohols into uh, the ketones. And in addition to that, you can also use something called an uh, DMP oxidation or Desmartin Peridone uh, oxidation. And that actually does the same thing. I'm not really going to draw the mechanism there, but uh, like suppose if you have a secondary or even a primary, primary alcohol. So secondary alcohols um, can be converted using this DMP reagent into and a ketone, and if you have a primary alcohol, it will get converted into an aldehyde. So both the DMP and the swarn oxidation, they are they use mild conditions where they don't really use acid, they just use the base in, in especially in case of swarn oxidation. So they are preferred over typically used oxidation methods by such as KMNF4 or K2CR2. 07 because you're using some toxic metals in that particular case. And finally, I want to talk about how you can use HiO4. So HiO4 or hydro or periodic acid is used to oxidize the diols, uh, especially the vicinal diols. If you have a vicinal diol, something like this, I can go ahead and use HiO4 and it can go ahead and convert I'm going to go ahead and make a small difference here. I'll have another methyl here. So what it really does, it actually breaks open this right there, and it will create an, a carbonyl group on both sides. So I can have, uh, suppose from the left side, from this side, I can have this as your carbonyl group. And then from the right side, from this side, I can have so keep track of your carbons there. I got three carbons there, and in the middle carbon, I'm going to have a carbonyl group. So you can either make aldehydes or ketones, depending on what type of diodes you're really dealing with. So these are the typical oxidation reactions you're going to be looking into when you're talking about these uh, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. If you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.